It was Monday, the 26th of April, 1976. Sid James, star of the Carry On films and various TV sitcoms, was appearing here at the Sunderland Empire in the first night of a farce called The Mating Season. Fifteen minutes after the play had started, a heart attack killed him at the age of 62. But there are stories that he still haunts this place and that in 1989, when the comedian Les Dawson was appearing here, the ghostly apparition of James practically frightened the life out of him. You've got to prepare yourself for what could be a terrible shock. <laughs> the British press in 1976 responded with their usual sensitivity. Laughing Sid is dead. Craggy Face comic Sid James died last night. He collapsed on stage at the Sunderland Empire. Sid, 63, was appearing in a comedy called The Mating Game. The jokes were flowing thick and fast when Sid slumped into a settee. Actress Olga Lowe told the audience, Sid's been taken ill. A doctor in the theatre tried to revive him, but he died later in hospital. He had already survived two heart attacks. Sid James, born in South Africa, had a famous partnership with Tony Hancock and a string of triumphs in his own right with popular TV series. He also starred in the Carry On films. On the same day that that report was published, April the 27th, a story appeared in the Northern Echo that appeared to think his name was Sidney Balmoral James. Of course it wasn't. That was the comedy name given to him by scriptwriters Galton and Simpson when he was appearing in Hancock's Half Hour in the 1950s. Your name is Sidney Balmoral Jones. James. James! <laughs> I knew I'd seen you somewhere before. Like that. In reality, his name was Solomon Joel Cohen. He was born in South Africa in 1913. And after originally working as a hairdresser, he found his metier in the Johannesburg repertory players. After that, he did his war service and moved to Britain in the 1940s, where he began to find a measure of fame in films like Ealing's The Lavender Hill Mob and on the radio. <laughs> oh, God, oh. But I'm going to skip his Hancock's Half Hour fame, his 19 Carry On films and his early 70s sitcom success with Bless This House on ITV to concentrate on that fateful night in Sunderland. Sid had suffered a serious heart attack in 1967, but to give him credit, he'd cleaned up his act in terms of giving up smoking, losing weight and drinking less. The previous week, appearing in Birmingham, he'd given an interview to the reporter, Fred Norris, in which he'd said, right up to the time I had the coronary, I went to the gym for a workout every day. I couldn't possibly believe that a man in my physical shape could ever have a coronary. But then it's not a matter of how much muscle you have. It's anxiety, overwork and pressures. I've made more than a hundred movies and at one stage I was making three all at the same time. You can't go on like that without expecting some sort of reaction. I was doing too much. You made me love you. Amen. Look happy. Why shouldn't I be happy? I'm young, attractive, and sexy. And what's more important, I have a very vivid imagination. <laughs> so we're 15 minutes into the play in Sunderland. Sid is sitting on a sofa. His co star, Olga Lowe, who's a friend from his days in South Africa, walks on stage, says her first lines. He replies. She sits next to him. She says another line. And he doesn't respond. Now he's such a rascal that she thinks he's kidding around. But then she looks and his head has slumped and his eyes have lolled back in his head. This was a jovial man who earlier on that evening had introduced himself to all the staff of the theatre even though he was one of the most famous faces in the country. He'd been laughing and joking with members of the cast as he was waiting in the wings for the curtains to open and now something was seriously wrong. So 
Olga call for the crew to bring the curtain down. And the stage manager, Mel James, was called. Sid's lips were turning blue. So the stage manager turned to the audience of 350 people and said, Ladies and gentlemen, is there a doctor in the house? And they laughed because they thought it was a joke. There was a doctor in the house, as it happens. He went up on stage. Sid had slipped into a coma and he died in the ambulance on the way to hospital. The Daily Mirror reported the next day that his wife Valerie ran on stage when she realised what had happened and cradled her dying husband in her arms. The Empire's audience was famously unforgiving with comedians and when its manager telephoned the show's producer to say Sid James has just died in Sunderland, he reputedly replied, don't worry, everybody dies in Sunderland. I mentioned a little earlier that the West Midlands journalist Fred Norris and he reported on the 27th that members of the audience at the Alexandra Theatre in Birmingham had been weeping openly when they'd heard that Sid James had died. I can't believe that I was with him here in this theatre as recently as Saturday, said one man as he left in tears. Norris added, he gave me what sadly may have been his last interview. It was an interview that had been delayed several hours at the request of his wife, Valerie. It's important that he doesn't overdo things these days, she said. I like him to get as much rest as possible. The genuine sadness of the general public was monumental. He was loved. He was very loved. And he brought a smile to people. So we could leave things there. Very sad showbiz story. But there's this twist in 1989. So you're an old traditionalist at heart, aren't you? You're going to do panto this year, Jack and the Beanstalk. Jack and the Beanstalk at Sutherland, yes. Well, nice. <laughs> and I am Gannel, they would be great. We're great. <laughs> Two nice people, Rosemary and uh, Diamond and Leighton, a nice team, yeah. yeah so the Liverpool writer, Tom Sleeman, I hope I've pronounced that right, who specialises in the supernatural, reports that Les Dawson was attuned to the afterlife in some way. He was sensitive to it. He apparently had seen ghosts before. According to his book, Liverpool 24, Dawson is in his dressing room in front of the mirror. He hears this familiar laugh off to his left. <laughs> and there in the mirror is the ghost of St. James looking ghastly, wearing some kind of white shroud and there's a smell of whiskey in the air. The apparition reportedly shouted something that Sleeman will never reveal and vanished. Dawson almost died of shock and vowed that he would never work at the Sutherland Empire again, which he didn't. Sleeman's book was published about a decade ago, but long before that, in 1995, Keith Goodwin wrote a biography of Sid James with the following epilogue. Dawson walks on stage looking subdued. He keeps looking over his shoulder towards the wings as if wishing the show were over. And several people, including a party of school children, notice that he seems to be shaking. Once the tour is over, he never works at the Sunderland Empire again. Reportedly telling a friend that what happened in the dressing room will stay with him for the rest of his life. He died in 1993. Is there anything to this at all? Well, in 2009, Melvin James, the stage manager I was talking about earlier, who was there on the night, was interviewed by another local paper here in the northeast of England, the Shields Gazette. I've heard the stories, Melvin told the Gazette, but if Les did see anything, he never mentioned it when he was here. Maybe he related something later, but I saw him regularly and he never made any such claims. Gently. <laughs> no, there's no stress at all. It's uh, I'm so happy. <laughs> <laughs> it's just lovely to be on the show. It's like being on the Titanic being on this show. <laughs> such a quality act. What? <laughs> I never knew you had an audience and I was right. Now listen. <laughs> Don't you take